Uh, Luke 15, please. Be turning to Luke chapter 15, and we will pick up our reading there. As we begin this morning, we're looking at the prodigal son, and most certainly the patient father. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Jesus tells us about a son who grew up under the love and care of his father. This is his earthly father. He knows his father, and he knows what it means to be at home, and he knows what it means to do his part. He leaves his father, as we've read together, and he lives a life of sin and pleasure until he has nothing left. Tells us that this young man came to himself. He came to his senses, in other words. And when he came to himself, when he understood with great clarity what was happening, he made a decision. He knew that he would be better off in his father's house, even if he was a servant, and he would then that he was in the far country, separated from his loving father. There's a deep truth in this lesson, the prodigal son, the parable, that we should not ignore. The prodigal son that we read about in this parable is the exception. He came to himself. He came home. This is not what most prodigals do after they walk away from the Lord. As sorry as I am to say that, and as unfortunate as it is, it is the truth. It takes courage to repent and to come home. It also requires an understanding that our decisions and our choices have consequences. I have to know, I have to understand that I cannot wallow in the filth of the world and imagine that I will remain clean before God, or that it will be easy for me to be restored after an extended period of time living in sin and wasteful living in the far country. The truth is, brothers and sisters in Christ, most prodigals never come home. I believe that most of them who know the truth plan to come home. I believe with all my heart that they tell themselves that they will come home at some point or some day. They recognize, they look around, and they know they're not where they should be. They know their parents would disapprove. They know God is upset with them. And so they make deals. They, they say, I'm going I'm to get this fixed. I, I'm going to start moving the right direction. But it's always down the road. It, it'll happen when it happens, not now, later. I also believe that many prodigals start back home. For those parents who may be here or may ever hear this lesson, who believe they have a prodigal in their life, a child who is a prodigal, be assured that your child starts back home. Whether the end result is not what we want to see just yet, there is a time when they say, okay, I'm, I can't keep doing this. I've got to get this straight. I need to be back home with my family. Some even try several times. The problem is, as I see it, is they have a lot to get past. It's such a long way back, and it's embarrassing to admit that you've been wrong. And it requires that, doesn't it? Remember what he said? Father, I've sinned before heaven, and I've sinned against you. That's tough. Because that means something to his dad. He's going to look into his dad's eyes and say, I've sinned against you. I've, I've done wrong. I've acted like a fool. And his father knows what that means. He knows the details of that. The brother says later that he wasted his spending, his, his funds, on harlots. The family knows what he's been doing. 
it hurts to go back and to say, I have been wrong or this is what I have done. But the truth is, because of those things, they don't want to come home. When they get their roots, <clears throat> their roots set down in the far country and drift further and further away from God and His Word, it becomes even harder to turn around and to right that ship. The entanglements of sin are very difficult to unravel because bad habits are so hard to break. And it is very difficult to turn away from the godless friends that you've made in the far country. Doesn't that, isn't that right? That even if you were to turn, that now you have companions or friends you spend a lot of time with, done a lot of things with, and now all of a sudden, if I do what's right, they're automatically the bad guy. They're not going to understand that. I could offer to them as a prodigal, I'm going home, you should come with me. They're probably not going to want to come. What am I left with as a prodigal? Honestly, what am I left with? I'm leaving the friends I have currently to go back to who? To go back to what? Well, my father's house. I know that's true. But who's there? Who will I be with? Who will I spend time with? prodigal may be very concerned that if he comes back, his loved ones will really never forgive him. He may say to himself, if they're going to hold this over my head now, I might as well stay here. They're not going to let, let me live this down. I might as well stay here and enjoy it while I can. And so it's a hard stop for them. I'm not going to go back. Every time I talk to them, they hold it over my head. What happens then to most prodigals? They fall into the trap of enjoying the passing pleasures of sin which God, our patient Father, had warned them about. Hebrews 11 and verse 25 tells us plainly there that by faith Moses chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So, so there it is again. I have to undergo the persecution with brethren in order to attain eternal life or... I can step into the passing pleasures of sin, enjoy myself, get what I can while I can. I'm already here anyway. You see, it's hard to leave that country. It's very hard to leave. The truth of the matter is the prodigal is someone who does not know the Lord and doesn't care much about him or his will. They may have been brought up. They may have been taught. But I'll, I'll give you an example, a Bible example, 1 Samuel chapter to Hophni and Phinehas, they're the sons of Eli. It says there in verse 12, 1 Samuel 2 and verse 12, they did not know the Lord. Yet their priests, they have the garb on, they're handling the sacrifices, they're laying with women in the temple right there at the front door of the tabernacle, I should say, at Shiloh. They're acting wickedly. And the Bible's clear to say that they don't know the Lord. How does God know that? How do we know that? Because of their behavior. Someone who knows the Lord knows that fear is a big part of that. And you can't live that way. So, they press on, not knowing the Lord. Now, it doesn't serve them well in that state to know Him. Because it means this can't go on. So they hold Him at bay. And by connection, they hold you at bay. You become less and less of a friend to them because you stand in opposition of their lifestyle and their decision to stop following God and to not know the Lord. I want to share something with you that I've noticed about prodigals. And more, more to the point of the long-term prodigal, that they've learned to become comfortable in the far country and to be comfortable in their own sin. Uh, once they've stayed in the far country for too long and decided that they're not coming home, I've realized at this time in their life that they have learned the best way to, to respond to you and to me. They have learned a way to say to you, I'm not coming back. Though we would reach out to them, though we would pray for them, and though we would ask them to reconsider their evil and wicked ways, we can ask them to come home. We can ask them to consider their relationship with their Heavenly Father. It's not a good answer, but it's good enough to keep you off their back. In the early stages of their departure, think, think about this with me. Someone who is stepping in to becoming a prodigal, starting to drift from God's people and from His church, and we have a responsibility to them. We absolutely do. We are the older brother in that sense, but not with a bad heart. 
with a right heart, a heart like the Father, a patient Father. We reach out to them, and they're new at this game, so usually their response is pretty pathetic, uh, and it's always based on the short term. They say, I haven't been feeling well recently, and that's why you haven't seen me. Uh, my work has been taking a real toll on me lately, and I'm not able to go to service. You see that? These are all short-term brief. Here's what's happening. Yes, I haven't been there. I'll be back. The pandemic has turned my life upside down. Really? Ever since the pandemic, I can't get things straightened out. Someone may say to you, is brother or sister so-and-so still there? Because I'm not going back until that's fixed. I won't go back while he's still there. Those are short-term answers. They are based on the idea that they will come back once things improve or once they settle down. Brethren, my encouragement to you is do not accept that as a legitimate answer as to why they have neglected the most important thing they could possibly do, and that is return to their Heavenly Father. Those are not good reasons. They never will be. You see, it's all temporal. It's all, well, once this is fixed, once my job's worked out, once I get things straightened out at work, once my sick parent or relative, once something happens with them, then I can get back to it. You're saying to me, a believing Christian, that you're going to put, take on the temporal and treat that more, expo- and more importantly than the spiritual that you're going to put your spiritual life at risk in order to accomplish something that will only be happening for a short time. That is pathetic and it's ridiculous. Do not accept it. It's a lie. That may be half the reason, but it's not the reason. No one who knows the Lord chooses to walk away. No one. Because they know Him. People who don't know the Lord, don't want to know the Lord, don't like the way worship services are handled, It doesn't appeal to them. Those are reasons. Those are real reasons why they walk away from God. And how you handle that is up to you. But we need to be more upfront and more strong about that which is offered to us. I haven't been feeling well recently. Well, how can I help? What can I do to help you feel better or to help you be at services? We've given brethren an opportunity in another way to say, oh, don't worry, I'm live streaming. I feel so much better. Thank you for telling me that. Because the Bible says to assemble. The Bible tells us to gather together, to look at one another, to spend time, to hear each other, to pray with and for each other. To look for opportunities to be engaged with each other. We'll have one this afternoon at 2 o'clock p.m. to come back with a practice singing. We have an opportunity by our own volition to come back and be with brethren and to work on some songs in spiritual things. And it takes someone who is dedicated to God and to His purpose to say, you know what, I think that's worth my time. And I've shared it with you before, if it's not worth your time, where will you be doing at 2 o'clock? Where will you be? By the way, I want to say to you, I won't be here at 2 o'clock. To to be fair and to be perfectly up front, we have an important meeting with our mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, which needs to take place. But you understand what I'm saying to you. There's always something temporal and short term that gets in the way, gets between me and God. And if I give it to someone who loves and honors God, that person should say, say that again? Repeat that and speak slowly so I can understand what you're saying. That does not register with someone who's spiritually minded. Do things come into our life that affect us and affect our worship services? Yeah, if you're living today, yes. There are things that happen. I could come up with a list of a hundred that are legitimate reasons that we can't do it now. There's something else that's in the way. There's all kinds of things that happen. But it cannot be the excuse. And for someone who loves God, though it's really happening to them in that moment, it is as short as it can possibly be because they're determined to get back to the house of God to be back with His people. Once they've been away for a while, and I just want to give this to you so that you'll know, the response typically turns toward Bible teaching and personal belief. So, you know, they've been gone for too long. They're just going to say something like, I've studied quite a bit on my own, and I don't agree with what is taught there. 
What's, what's the right response for that? I've been at home studying by myself, and I just realized I don't agree with what y'all teach at Northwest. Can I, can I share with you what your response should be? Why aren't you coming back and telling us our error? Are you seriously willing to let this many souls go to hell because our teaching is incorrect? You figured it out and now you're staying home? If you've been studying, you know better than that. If we're teaching something in error, we want to hear about it. We want to know so we can correct it. Jesus told the churches in the book of Revelation to repent. They had a, re a responsibility to do that and an ability to do it. They needed to be willing to. Don't let anyone tell you that what you teach over there isn't true. Then why did you walk away? That doesn't make you a soldier. It makes you a coward. If you knew they were trying to teach the truth and you chose to leave them because they weren't, you led a lot of people in a terrible place. Why did you do that? You see, most excuses don't even make sense. We're talking about spiritual nature. We're talking about a devotion to God. We're talking about someone who loves the Lord and who loves His people and try to help those who also want to go to heaven. They might be bold enough to say, I don't believe what you believe. Now that is, that is a hard stop. I just don't believe what you believe. Their tone will be much more abrasive and forceful, and it is delivered in a way that shuts down any further discussion. This is how this works with prodigals. They're not ashamed. They don't want to give you the slightest hope that they might consider the error of their ways and come to themselves and come home to God. And it does happen. We know from the parable of the prodigal son that those who have left the Lord and the eternal promise of heaven are still in the pig pen, aren't they? They are still in the pig pen and they are finding it really hard to leave. And that is just the truth. The prodigal son who came home is the exception. But they do exist today, don't they? There are those who left and came home. What's the responsibility for the brethren who are here? If you're a prodigal who's come back, you know more than anyone the responsibility of brethren, how they should be, how they should act, and how they should treat one who comes home to be with God. I need to be able to say to myself, if someone were to come back today, I need to be able to say to myself, as a servant of my Father, I'm better off. I am a willing servant. That's all I am. And if someone wants to come back to God, I will never stand in their way. And I will never harbor any grudge against them. Because repentance that is real is a repentance that God accepts. And for me or for you to act like the older brother and to demand more because we've been better is such a shame. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about eternal life with God. And if it's possible for anyone that we would assist in that and never keep it from taking place. For those of you who have prodigals, and I know that we do, <clears throat> please don't forget that God is the one who has the prodigals. We take it personal. They're family members of ours. We love them. We've tried to share the truth. They won't come back. God is more hurt about that than you are. And we have to know that. If I'm working to bring someone back, then I'm working with God. He wants the same thing that I do. But he's hurt far deeper than I am. His son died on a cross knowing that those would walk away. We want to be in line with God. We want to be in line with his will. We want to welcome the prodigal home and to rejoice, to celebrate. Because that which was lost has been found. He who was dead has been made alive by being restored to God's church and to his people. Let me give you one final verse. Well, let me give you two, actually. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. The Bible's clear and the Bible is serious, as is God, for those who would come to know the Lord, to know the truth, and then walk away or drift away. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 says, For if, after they've escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. 
For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. The individual who has come to know the truth, full knowledge of Jesus Christ, what has been accomplished on their behalf, uh, to be added to the Lord's church, to be obedient for a span, and then to be entangled. You see, all of us need to be careful because those entanglements exist for all of us. And they do pull on us. There are things going on. There are attitudes and concerns in our heart that mislead us. In all walks of life, not just with attendance, but with all walks of life. And we've got to be on guard because to be entangled, to be burdened by the weight of sin once again is to step away and to walk away from the Lord. And what does it look like to God? The pig who is brought in, washed and cleansed thoroughly to be prepared for show. The master of the pig who's washed the pig wants to show the pig off. That's why they clean them. But the pig has an innate desire. To go back to the fill. And people do too. But God says you are a dog going back to your own vomit. The things you knew to be wrong, the things you knew to be wretched and wicked that you turned away from, now since changed your mind, after God has granted His grace to you, you have changed your mind, you've gone back to the vomit that you know is filthy. And the prodigal, the prodigal is just that. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. This is the promise from Almighty God. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the prodigal who begins to walk, walk away and says, I will come back. I just need to figure this out. I'll get it done. Uh, once these things clear up, I'll recommit myself for that person, 2 Peter 3, 9. You're counting God's slackness as opportunity to sin, to not be with Him and not be serving Him. That is a fool's errand and a terrible mistake. God is not slack concerning His promise. What is He then? He's waiting. He's given me plenty of time to step into the world, to step into the church, go back to the world, step back into the church. He just keeps going. Why is he waiting? What does it say? So that we'd have time to come to repentance. To make our life right with God. To stand before God cleansed and whole and unashamed. That's who we long to be. And that's who we long our brethren to be. Whether they're here with us now or they have drifted from the truth. Don't ever stop knocking on the door and putting in phone calls to the prodigals that you know. They know the truth and they should come home. What's interesting about the prodigal to me is that there's a moment, and we saw it in the parable, there's a moment when they come to themselves. You know, they, they come to their own senses. I can't force my sense, my understanding, on someone else who doesn't care, isn't interested. It just won't work. I can be as right as I've ever been, and it won't matter if it doesn't apply to them. So, so what does it take sometimes? And I, I hate to say this because it shouldn't be this way. What does it take? Disease, pain, anguish, a world who keeps kicking you and kicking you and kicking you. And somewhere in your mind, and all that time away from the Lord and away from His people, somewhere in your mind, that little light starts to flicker. And you have the courage to ask yourself, <clears throat> I wonder if the brethren here on Sunday right now, I wonder if they're, I know they're at church, I wonder if they're kicking each other. I wonder if they're lying to each other. I wonder if they're cheating and stepping on each other's necks to get ahead in life. The person who's been to church knows the answer to that. So unfortunately, the prodigal who lives wasteful living with their soul has to get to the bottom of the pit. We don't want them there, and we can't push them there. But if they know God, then they will come to their senses and they will say, I have acted foolishly. 
even the servants in my father's home are treated better than what I have now. And if that's what it takes to bring them home, then you know your role and I know mine. Open those arms as wide as you can get them. Forgive those who come in repentance. Restore these brethren to the church. And let's get stronger. We have our work cut out for us on every level. I appreciate your careful attention this morning. It is a difficult lesson. It's not one that we're fond of going through or talking about, but it is a reality of the world we live in. And I hope and pray that it's helpful to you this morning. Use it to your benefit. Go out and reach out to those who may need you at this hour. If there's anyone in our number who needs to respond, there may be someone who needs to get things right, and they're ready to do that. Again, I don't force the timeline. That is something that comes upon your heart, and you say, now's the time. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to do what's right. I need the prayers of the church. I need help. God has supplied the church to do that very thing for you. There's so much here available to help you to stay strong, remain strong, to walk in faith. We can help you do that this morning. Come forward while together we stand and sing.